You are listening to the Real Estate Informant Podcast. Good afternoon, everybody. Another wonderful day. To you too, sir. Good thank afternoon. You, thank you. Good afternoon. Thanks for having me here. To my right across the table from me is a very, very, very good friend of mine. Been in the business. Oh, my God. Don't if suck. I've been in the business 20 years, just about. He's been in the business. Don't say it. Show my age, please. A little. A little okay. A little longer. Yeah, right? Well, that's good enough. All right. Financier <laughs> extraordinaire, right? Uh, residential home lending, commercial lending. Um, this young man and I have been uh, doing lots of work together for at least the last, what, decade or so, 12 years maybe, Just in now. the uh, hard money space, in the private lending space. Um, we've done ton- hundreds of deals uh, over the last at least 10, 12 years. Yeah. You think it's been a long run. I don't realize how long we got started right after long, kind of I'm not done introducing you yet. You're not oh. done. I'm not done. Okay. I didn't give you your name. I didn't even, I got to finish. Okay. I got to give my, I'm not going to interrupt you. I got to give my okay, thing. Go ahead. I'm not okay. going to interrupt you. Lender extraordinaire, hard money, soft money, private money, <laughs> loud money, <laughs> whatever you want. The money man himself, Mr. Raphael Farino. I like that. I appreciate being here. Uh, obviously, uh, we used the holiday season. It's a great time of year. Everyone's in great moods. Um, there's still work to be done. But I'm glad to have them. I'm really excited to get out there and tell people what it takes. Mm-hmm to accomplish things that they want to accomplish. So it's really exciting to have me here. Awesome. I love some of the work you're doing and looking forward to kind of expand on that. Yes. So today on the Real Estate Informant Podcast, what we're going to do is we want to talk specifically about, because I get so many questions on a daily basis, about how to become a real estate investor. Mm-hmm. People, everyone wants to know how to do it. And what's the most important thing? The money if you want to invest. Sure. Now, we're not talking about wholesaling. We're not talking about... Uh, flipping contracts. We're talking about actually investing in real estate. Right. You're going to have to need, you're going to need some kind of capital. You're going to need capital. So the what's fluid right now on the streets is capital, hard money in particular. So people have a lot of questions about private lending and hard money. That's why we're talking today. Sure. Um, being that you are the expert at this, right? Even more so than I, you've been doing it a lot longer than I have. I've, and I'm like, I'm humbled to say that I've, I've borrowed <laughs> millions and millions and millions of dollars um, <laughs> from your fund. And the fund. fact that we're still here means you, you paid it all back. So. <laughs> <laughs> as well as that, like now we're in a, now, you know, after you do it for so long, like anything else, you become a professional at it and you can help people at it. So now we've created our own uh, partnership and now we're, we're, we're lending the people together and that's a part of putting your big boy pants on. That's it. Right? And helping a lot of people. And I'm, I'm educating them on how to become investors. But in this space particularly, I really want to give you the floor today. Sure. Because I really want you to spill your expertise into my audience's uh, ears, okay. so to speak. So um, first off, because we keep talking, a lot of people don't even understand. Like, what is a hard money lender? You know, that's obviously, I get a, a ton of calls. And speaking of clients, mm-hmm. my salespeople, they really don't understand the nature of hard money business. They just think it's an expensive way to do something. And we need to kind of dispel that immediately, right? So the first thing is, if you really had to boil it all down and give you a very simple way to explain hard money, it's a business loan made against residential real estate, okay, for investment properties. That would be the simplest way to boil it all down, get rid of all the fancy jargon, all the stuff that people want to complicate it. That's it, right there. So anyone qualifies as long as it meets that criteria. It so being the property. The property. Meets the criteria. Correct. Got it. They can't want to live there. It's not the space that we want to be in. It's not for your primary residence. Okay? The nature of it, again, it's a business loan made against residential or small commercial. Depends on, on this nature. But I think for this audience today, it's a little more residential based. Yes. Right? And it has to be an investment property. I think there's the important part of it that you must complete has to be an investment property. Okay. So, so when someone takes on a hard money loan, what's the actual intent? It's because they have there's so many questions. Oh yeah. The biggest question is why is the interest rate so high? <laughs> My home mortgage is at three and a half percent. Yes. Why is this rate double or triple that? That's actually a good question. I probably answer that question. 15, 20 times a day. So I'll be more than happy <laughs> to do it again for you. Okay. And the reason why the rates are 
much higher than three and a half percent. For one, most of the times we're lending on what we call a distressed asset. Okay, for your audience members who may not know what that is, a distressed asset is a property that needs work. It needs to be renovated, it needs to be fixed, repaired, whichever you want to put it. So on all of those podcasts of yours where you're showing yourself fixing the house up, mm-hmm. those are the houses that we generally we, we finance and we lend on. If you tried going to your local lender of Chase or Wells or anybody else, and you sh- once they did the appraisal, they would reject your file immediately. So those properties, because they're not habitable, wouldn't qualify for traditional financing. So once you don't qualify for that kind of financing, you get put into a special sector of the market, okay? That's where we come into play. And the reason why rates are higher, because there's incredibly much more risk involved. And also, it's the short-term nature of of the loan, which I think we'll dive into that a little bit further. Mm -hmm. That's the reason why, so to boil it all down again, rates are more expensive because of the risk associated to lending on a property that's inhabitable. Well, that's exactly like... The rebuttal that you just gave, the long-winded one, I give a short one, usually when people ask me. That's okay. And they say, the interest rate is it's so high. I say, high compared to what? <laughs> like, what are you comparing it to? That's like, what? there is no direct comparison to any other product, right? When you're looking to buy something, you're taking on a business partner when you're taking on hard money. That's lending. a great way to look at that's, it. That's the only way to look at it. You're taking on a business partner, and typically what happens, yes, your interest rate might be 10, 11, or 12%. Mm-hmm. A month for the span of a year. So say you make a two hundred thousand dollar purchase and you're paying the highest interest. Say you're paying twelve percent. Say it costs you two grand a month, and it takes you four months to get in and out of the project. In and out of the project, it costs you eight thousand dollars in borrowed capital Mm -hmm. to on on a monthly basis. Your partner just supplied eighty or ninety percent of the cost of the property and the cost of the construction. That's right. Because hard money lending is not the acquisition of the property solely. It's the money that that you. Um, it's the acquisition money to get the property, as well as the lender lends you the money a hundred percent of the construction cost. Right. So when you say it's expensive, I'm just like compared to what? Because it's not con- it's not expensive compared to having a partner. No, it's not. Because any other partnership arrangement, you'd be putting out half, and they'd be putting out half, and then the profit comes down when when it, you go to closing, you sell the property, half goes to you, and half goes to your partner. So. The, the partner's giving you 90% of the money to buy and 100% of the construction money, and you turn your nose up and you say it's expensive, expensive. it's not as, as expensive as a, as a regular partner on the street would be because they take half your profit because they put in half the money of the deal. You know, the best way to kind of compliment that is it beats the alternative. What's the alternative is a partner. Yes. Partnerships are a lot more expensive once you weigh them out the hard money funding. Yes. But also a lot of people... And then I get this question a lot from clients when they're new and they, they're just trying to figure out how it works. And they're trying to get their hands around why is it so expensive? Why must you charge so much? And what they have to realize is the money comes from different sources. Right? Money is all green, but it sure comes from different places, okay? And everything is based on risk. All lending is based on risk. When you can begin to delever risk, the money price changes. Yes. And I think that's what clients need to understand even in the hard money space, larger down payments would generally lower your rate. Yes. Okay? Properties that don't need as much renovation, need very little, could generally go different directions. So yes. everything is risk-based. That's one thing that new investors will begin to learn as they as they dive deeper into the space. Yes. And that's something, like I said, it's it's, it's been a normal business practice of mine to, uh, in acquiring all these properties for the last 15 or so years. I mean, 15 or so, 14 years ago. I was playing, I remember I was paying 15, 16% sure. and four and five points for the money over the course of time with more experience, the money's gotten a lot cheaper. But without that um, that investor partner, that's the hard money lender, there's no way I would have made a nasty amount of wealth nope. and success I could have nope. done on my own. Because you think about it, if it's just about leverage, other people's money, leverage. Because you can take, and we're in New York, right? New York is a more expensive market than other areas yes. in the country. But just in New York, if you take a million bucks in New York and you're looking at, say, $1 million, your median price of a home, say, somewhere like Long Island is about $400,000. Sure. So even if you bought the home at a discount and you got the house at, let's say, 50% of its active repair value, you got it at $200,000, you can, with a million bucks, you can do probably three houses and pay for the renovation because two, 
four, six, right. 600 grand for acquisition. Each house, you're going to put 100 grand in if you're getting them that cheap and, then right. and you want to sell them for top, do- top dollar. So you're into it for $900,000. You did three deals with almost a million bucks. Hard money, 10%. You've just leveraged a million dollars literally to $10 million. That's right. Literally. There's a time factor of money. What happens is when people want to use their own cash in these transactions, and again, cash is the greatest way to obviously get something done, but it's also very limited because we only have but so much of it, no matter Mm -hmm. who you are. Everyone that I know of, no matter how deep their pockets are, they borrow once they understand that principle that you just said. Mm -hmm. And we deal with some very wealthy people that have done really well using hard money, and we deal with first-timers who need to understand the power of leverage. So that works both ways. And speed. Speed also too. The hard money game requires speed. Because if you take too long to fix your property, if you take too long to renovate it, put it back on the market and sell it, that's when you start to feel it. It's not as attractive anymore. So you want to get in. You want to have the right construction budget, your right scope of work together. And um, you want to be able to sell in a timely fashion so you don't hold the property for only for more than a year. Let's get into that. Sure. Let's get into more of the parameters of the length of time of a, a hard money loan and the other factors that people might want to know because we're speaking from a place of you know knowing everything about it and sometimes mm-hmm. we gotta in this when we're being this descriptive we gotta, we gotta like forget everything we know <laughs> and start from the beginning that's also true all right so starting from the beginning so this is spring um, training this is spring, spring training, training on hard money spring tra- spring training on hard money. i like that okay so um step what are the steps of acquiring the money first off what are the steps of acquiring the money well when we lend right the first thing that really jumps out at us is experience. We want to vet experience because that gives us a, that paints us a picture. Remember, we're not looking for tax returns. We're generally not looking for um, your job history doesn't mean, mean very much to me. So most people get caught up in, well, I have a great job and I make good money. Like That's fantastic. And if you were looking for a traditional mortgage, that'd be right up their alley. We're not really looking for that because what we're looking for is subsidized equity. So we want to make sure that you've done this before. You understand how to find a, a, a discounted value of a house. So, and you know how to fix it, renovate it, market it, and bring it to the finish line. When you show that you have never done this before, we generally look at it. And once again, it comes down to risk as we started speaking about it. That highlights the risk part of it. Okay, this person has no experience. Now, we don't want to deter you from doing it. But we just want you to understand that we have to take different precautions because you haven't done it before. First thing is risk. Second thing we do is now credit. Now, there, used, there was a time in the day in hard money, so I'm bringing us back a little bit, mm-hmm. where nobody even ran a credit report. They didn't look at it. They only cared about the equity in the property. Mm-hmm. As the market developed, as Wall Street, we'll use them for lack of a better term, started obviously – they saw the lure and the power of the of the industry. They started now putting their 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 hands into the arena. They look for credit scores. Credit scores are not what you look for at Chase or other banks, but we do look for them. We just want to see that the person has a pulse and that they've kind of paid things right. on time. You pay, yeah. You you like your house is in foreclosure. Yeah. You're not you're not in, in an active bankruptcy. You haven't filed in the last year, right? Um, just a responsible. Yeah. Uh, person that's what you're all. looking for just responsible because and once you kind of get a feel of those two pieces then we look at what they do for a living what you do for a living does impact yes so if someone's a licensed contractor right but they may they may have fixed and renovated many different homes throughout but they never actually bought a home to flip that's fine we work with those people all the time some of them are realtors or you know real estate brokers that they've sold hundreds and hundreds of homes but they never actually done one for themselves mm-hmm. happens all the time mm-hmm. then we get to the third type of client besides from the highly experienced investor third client who really never touched a space mm-hmm. doesn't work in the industry mm-hmm. that person needs the most assistance he well needs, they got well they're experienced as far they as watch hgtv TV. well that's well HGTV. i was just leading them there they're, they're, they're experienced people they are they spend hours and hours and hours a week watching hgtv and they well, can do this to themselves as well in how long does it take to flip a house 30 minutes <laughs> 30 minutes yeah that's how long closing microwaveable takes. house place. <laughs> if everyone shows up on time <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but really when they have no experience what they really need and and i i actually you know we get spoiled working with 
experienced investors and they're great and they're demanding and they want things done yesterday and we get it. And that's, that's, but there's the other side of it. There's a side where we do get the first time investor. I love that person. I'll tell you why. They come to me with every idea they have. They talk to me about the future, what they want to build. Here's the ideas. Most of them don't work because they haven't really vetted the process yet, but I love that they have the enthusiasm to get that started. So those are the customers that I usually take a little more close and I say, look, you either need this or you need that. And usually partnership guidance, things like that is where they need it first until they really get themselves going. And many of those customers have become the experienced investor over time, mm -hmm. but it does take a process. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times it's a good thing. I always tell people um, the, the easiest way, right, to not make mistakes is to follow someone who's made them all already. Oh, that goes without saying. So if you can find someone, even if you're in the space of hard money, if you need to borrow hard money, but if you can find someone like a contractor or you can find someone like a real estate investor to partner with you on these deals so you don't make the mistakes, then that, that softens the blow as well. That makes the learning curve a lot, a lot, a lot easier. Just people don't understand, or I don't know if they forget, they don't understand. Sometimes they're too greedy. Partnering up in this business is paramount to any amount of success. Of course. Constantly power. Real estate in and of itself, you always want to partner with people who've done it before. You, There's been, since the beginning of time, you can call it apprenticeship, you can call it partnership, you can call it anything you want. Starting off as an assistant to someone. I didn't start off in this chair. You know, it took me time to get here. Mm -hmm but I had no problem being under someone's thumb or under someone's flag for a while until you learned it. Because the experience you get, you never forget. That's right. the trick, right. right? The experience and the knowledge, you never forget it. Right. So I think I would implore anyone to want to work with somebody that has done it at least. That's how you get it. Because once you do get it, it really is not that complicated. Let's talk about this chair. Let's okay. talk about the journey we've been on personally. Sure. Let's talk about the fact that when we first met, in 2002, 2003, I was a telemarketer. Yes, you were. In a mortgage company making $300 a week. Uh huh. I was a telemarketer in a mortgage company making $300 a week. Now, 16 years, almost 17 years later, look where we are. That's right. We all have to start somewhere. I started somewhere, and you were my senior at that mm -hmm. point. You had already been well established. You were one of the top guys in the company, um, but it just goes to show exactly that that apprenticeship that, and we've had a relationship ever since. That's right, and it hasn't changed. And you have to start somewhere. And a lot of times, trying to skip or jump that learning curve is why you, how you really hurt yourself, you especially do. in and especially in investing. I mean, it, it applies to most things in life. But when it comes to investing, like you're talking about. Your savings, you're talking about your family's money, you're talking about uh, your 401k, your retirement, you're talking about, you know, your kid's college fund, whatever it could be. When you take that risk and you take that leap into real estate investing, you want to make sure you cover all your dots. Lance, I want to ask you, I, I know I should be receiving the questions today, but I want to ask you one mm -hmm. because you're touching a point that I think people really need to listen carefully. Why do you attend the amount of seminars that you do? Um, number one is knowledge to constantly be abreast of what's going on. Number two, it's network and growing my network base and getting familiar with the actual, what people are doing and what the industry is doing. Because you can't, you always want to be aware of what's happening in the industry, no matter what industry you're in. Bumping shoulders, creating relationship, meet, relationships, meeting other people from other um, areas of the country and even other aspects of the business. It's just a matter of, you know, knowledge. That's right. It's knowledge and relationships. When we were coming up, we used to go to. Uh, we were fortunate to work for a company at that time that did a lot of, a lot of this type of training, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I think the one line that I'll never forget is "success leaves clues," right? Yes. That sticks with me everywhere we go. Mm -hmm. And um, what you're doing out here is fantastic. Your success, you. you've been through the rigors, the ups and downs, everything else in between. For you to now want to extend yourself and your experience to whether it's newcomers, whether it's people that have just started, whether they have a dream of doing it, they need to realize that that's the right place to start and spawn off from that. I think it's fantastic what you want to accomplish out here. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. Anytime.
every day. That's what we do every day. We're looking to create or help other people not make some of the mistakes. Because I made, listen, <laughs> I made lots of them. You've seen lots of them. I made over the years ago. You've yeah. seen. Like, I, I made a lot of mistakes. You know, a lot of them. I didn't. The thing about me is everything that I'm telling people now is success leaves clues. I didn't have the person to work under as a part. Way part. I, didn't, I figured it all out myself. <laughs> I wish I had the person because I would have cut my time. I would have probably in a third. But I'm going to tell you, being a, your being a personal lender for you and a friend, when you did make mistakes and. It's okay. It, it, to sit here and say, Yo, I didn't make a mistake. I'm in mean, this chair. is ridiculous. Tons I made them too. The one other thing that comes along with that is character. Mm-hmm. You never ducked under a table when mistakes happened. You met them head on. And that's the real reason why you're here because you can't hide from your mistakes when you make them. You got to hit them head on. The way you went after the business, the way you went after the way you have to hit your mistakes too. Exactly. You got to hit them head on. Exactly. And that's what a lot of people don't realize about that that space. Because in your space, I know, after a while, a hard money, hard money lender becomes nothing but a bill collector when, you, when you're not making, your construction's not moving fast enough, you still got to make the interest payments, you're chasing the borrow, what's going on, work's not happening or it is happening, you're not making your payment, they're ducking, you're not answering the phone, right. they don't want to talk to you, they're embarrassed. That's not the way to do it. Did you ever lend someone a friend of yours? I think Bronx Tale did a really good part of this, and I may, maybe I may be dating myself by using that reference. But if I forget did, about sorry. it, forget. Well, the good. I'm I'm sure you've watched it, but for our younger audience, watch Bronx Tale. Okay, in case it's a really good movie. It was made in the '90s. But I guess the moral of what I'm trying to say is, he lent someone twenty dollars, and um, the person kept ducking him, he kept asking for his money back. Right, and you know. The second part to that is, well, don't worry. He walked out of your life for twenty dollars. You got off easy. Exactly. Our part of it doesn't work that way. Right? <laughs> <laughs> we don't get off easy. Yeah, right. When I lend someone money, right. and I want to contact you, I have no problem with you saying, "Hey, listen, things aren't going right." That's when I can get proactive and say, "Look, let me talk to you. Why don't we figure this out? Let's talk it through." Ducking is never the right thing to do. Oh, believe me, I got people in my phone right now that aren't in. Like I literally, literally, I've, I think I bought some relationships. Right. What I mean by I bought them, like, they owe me money. I haven't gotten it back. Right. And I guess I paid for the relationship to end. That's that what point. you did. That's what you did. I, because it could have been much worse. So I pay, I actually paid you to get out of my life. Yeah. It's, I guess that's the only way you can think of it. It, think it of is. It. You did. And it's um it, it definitely applies to what we're doing right now. So back into the, the money part sure. itself, right? Um, As far as the requirements, like we said, credit score is not really one. You want to make sure you have a good value, right? And this is... This is a, a re, this is a thing that people don't understand. Um, a good after repair value versus your loan, your loan to value. A lot of people don't understand that. Like they'll say things like, "Well, the house is worth two hundred thousand. I'm getting it for one sixty. It's a good deal. It only <laughs> needs twenty five in work." <laughs> yeah, that's that's um, we get a but we get a lot of those. There's the first part of learning. What does this term which they have to get it's called subsidized equity Mm -hmm. they're going to learn that over time if they want to be good in this space finding a deal as lenders i want you to understand something when we say no it's not personal i promise it's not personal our job is to lend money right we want to be in that process we want to make a prudent loan so when there's something valued at 200 and you're buying it for 160 by the time you close on it market it it's done there's no profit left and I wouldn't want you to make your first loan be non-profitable. So I'm going to say no. But I want them to understand why it's a no. Because we've come from the school of there's no and then there's yes if. Mm-hmm. Remember yes if? Yes right? if. Remember that? Yes if. The answer is always yes if. Yes, if it's a good deal. Mm-hmm. We'll lend. Mm-hmm. Right? When I say no, I hate it because it closes the door. Yes. I don't want to do that. So the investors, they need to start to understand, and I think you're going to do a much better job of teaching them about the value on what constitutes a deal and what's not a deal. Right. Especially, and there's two ways to look at a deal, right? We're, we're, we're talking about flipping right now. Mm-hmm. Now, if you're buying something that's, you know, valued at 200 and you're getting it at 160 and it needs 25 at work and you're buying it as a buy and hold mm-hmm. and as um, what you're going to be able to rent it for, you can actually make money on a monthly basis. It's great passive income because all the times when, when you buy properties for passive income, the value a lot of times doesn't matter as much right. as long as the rent roll is is um, positive. Mm-hmm. So it's not really that. We're talking about fixing and flipping, and flipping specifically. Let's not get confused, people. Okay. Every Sometimes a little bit of equity can still be a deal, 
but never when fixing and flipping. Right. You need to have at least 30, 30, 35% equity in that deal. What's the old ad in real estate? You make money on a property when you buy it. There you go. Not when you sell it. Simple and plain. Yep. We see it that way too because we lend on it based on what you're buying for. Yep. Not based on what you potentially could sell it for. Yep. So typically when someone takes on one of these deals, um, how long do you expect them to hold it before they're in and out of it? What does that look like? The national average, and I'll start there and then I'll kind of work my way backwards, is about nine months. From the time that they purchase From it? From the time they purchase it. Okay. Right? So from when they purchase it, from when they close, the national average is about nine months on these on these hard money loans from when they get the property renovated, marketed, and sold. Okay. So all of our loan terms are one year. Okay. And you should notice if it's done right and you're focused on and you're on top of your renovation – you should be able to have the house marketed within six to eight months, mm-hmm. preferably then sold and on your way to a closing. Okay. If it's going longer than that, would you agree that something's probably not working right? Something's off. Right. Something's off either. And I've had those situations myself. It could be a permit process mm-hmm. um, that went off. It could be a bad contractor right. that uh, you have to get rid of. And, and a lot of times if you don't have your crew together, that's what the new people will start to realize. Like the contractors, like two people can make or break you. Your lender and your contractor. More importantly, after you get the property, your contractor. And that's like a very hard lesson I learned over the years that your contractor is necessary, is absolutely your partner because they can be the one to make a break or they can prolong the job. Um, you might have to get rid of them and start all over. Once you start all over, you're spending double money because anytime you get a contractor to follow up behind another contractor, he's going to charge you double of what he, what he would originally charge you anyway. It's unfortunate, but it's true. Very true. And you lose. So, um, in that in that aspect, yeah, it's it, like we said, it's a year term mm-hmm. typically. Um, inside of that year is where you want to have them done. I usually try to have mine done between four and five months. Right. If you exceed that year, usually as long as you're making your payments on time, your lender will extend that for you. you might pay a yes. little bit of a, a small fee, but they'll extend it um, a month by month. I like to give you the, the first help. three months for free on extension. Uh, sure. When I use the word free, it still costs every month. But I don't really want to charge because I, I want to see them complete this project. Yes. You know, at our company, we have a stance is we want to build wealth through real estate. So we want our clients to do well. It, it, it makes them want to come back. It makes them want to keep doing it. They should want to be successful at it. Yes. There's a hard money slogan out there, and you may see it. There's lend to own shops, and then there's not. What I mean by that is when we make a, a loan, as you put it best, we're your partner, you know? And I think I want people to understand that when they do get involved with the lender, there is a partnership there on some level. And the partnership could be revolving mm-hmm. on that property, the next one, and so on. So we don't we don't want to be draconian. And if something goes past the time, we show our fangs, our sharp elbows. We really don't want to do that. Mm-hmm. We want people to communicate with us. We want to work with them on this project moving forward. Let's give the people a real-life scenario. Sure. So let's say um, what a hard money loan would look like so off the top of our head let's just use some round numbers mm-hmm. so say you're buying a property and the after repair value is four hundred thousand sure you're in contract to buy it for two hundred and fifty thousand it needs fifty thousand dollars in repairs how does that look on paper to if you're buying it for two hundred and fifty thousand dollars that was the price I said, right? It was two fifty. It was two fifty. Mm-hmm. It was two hundred. Should be two hundred. Okay, if you're buying it for two hundred thousand dollars, right? That's your purchase price. Mm-hmm. What will the lender lend you on that two hundred thousand dollar purchase price? So the first thing we do is we want to know what's the property worth when renovated, and how much will it take to get there. Mm-hmm. That's the first thing we want to figure out, and that's going to determine what's called our ARV, which after repair value. Right, which the acronym stands for is the after repair value. If we come up with a $400,000 after repair value, generally we're, we're most comfortable lending up to 65% of that, right? So what winds up happening is the following. Now we go to contract price. Well, most people say, well, then if you can lend 65% of it, why don't you lend all of it? Because we don't. There has to be a down payment on contract. Skin in the game. Yeah, you said it best. Got to have some skin in the game. You have to. People, because it's very important because on any partnership, we don't mind taking on the great brunt of it. 
but there has to be some sort of equal partnership. And your equal part of it is putting up your portion of the down payment. Mm -hmm. It keeps them motivated to go with. So if we took this $200,000 and you put 10% down, you have a base loan of now 180. 180. Mm -hmm. Now comes the repair portion. So we know you have a base loan amount of $180,000. Mm -hmm. We'll now say, how much does it cost to fix? How much costs to fix this property, Lex? Let's say it's um $50,000. Uh, let's say. Should be a little more than that for that price. Let's say it's $80,000. $80,000. Yeah. We're going to take that $180,000. Now we're going we're gonna to tack on the $80,000 to repair it. Okay. That loan, that $80,000, generally, and I want people to understand, it's, it's set aside in a construction reserve. And that money, you only pay interest on that money when you draw it. So it is a very inexpensive option to have an $80,000 credit line kind of waiting for you. That's exactly what it is. It's a credit line waiting cool. for you after you purchase. So let's just run through the numbers one sure. more time. So you purchased the property for $200,000. That's your contract price. Correct. You put 10% down on the $200,000. Mm -hmm. The lender lends you $180,000. You have $80,000 that you're going to need to do construction on the property. Right. The lender also lends you the $80,000. Mm -hmm. So now in total, you're into the property for $260,000 of borrowed money. Eighty thousand of that mo dollars of that money is being held in a construction reserve for you to pull draws on. What draws are are um, as you do the work, the lender comes out and checks and verifies, and they release the funds for the work as the job progresses. Usually, it's a two or three, sometimes a four step process, mm -hmm. depending on how often you want to pull money from right. the lender. And you only pay interest on that credit line when you use it. So if your first draw is only twenty thousand, eighty thousand is allowed to you. You only pull twenty. You're only paying the interest on that twenty. Once you borrow 40, you're paying interest on the 40, right. so on, so forth and so on. So you've literally financed $260,000 of the project that has a value of four hundred grand. That's right. So when customers ask, well, don't you give 100% of it? I say, I'll do more than 100% of your purchase price. We want a little money up front from you mm -hmm. that binds you into the deal, mm -hmm. makes you really committed to get it done. We'll do our part. Yeah. I'll lend you more than 100% of contract price. Yeah. And people get caught up on one thing. What is the interest rate? The, listen, I, I don't even, depends on criteria, credit, experience, things of that nature. The rule of thumb that I tell everyone, this is the rule of thumb when you're borrowing hard money. You should be paying 1% of what you borrowed on a monthly basis. Look at it that way. So if you borrowed $260,000, look at your payment to be $2,600. That's right. It's a very good benchmark. That's it. On. Because if you have the worst credit and the worst scenario, period, that's the most you would spend, 1%, which is 2600 which That's is, right. That's equivalent to a 12% 12%, rate. correct. And if you, if it, your credit were better, it would be a little bit lower. It would be lower. But in the the cost of doing business, this is what really, with new investors, it gets annoying. When they talk about interest rates, what's the difference between paying $2,600 a month and $2,400 a month over the course of six months if at the end of the day you're going to make $140,000? And you want to argue with me on your interest rate because you want your payment to be twenty four hundred, not twenty six hundred. But at the end of the day, the guy that's putting up all the money for you is only making those small interest payments. Every that's all. That's his only profit. Right. Those small interest payments. And then what you're making is one hundred sixty. You're counting his money, but he doesn't count yours. No. It's just, people just aren't fair. Well, <laughs> it's just not fair. They're not fair, but most of them come around. They course, get it after a while. They get it. I was one of those guys in the beginning. I thought everybody. Was me and Rob, I mean, why, why, why me? It should be cheaper, and, and I figured it out. Well, what, it all compare and contrast. If you compare me to the three and a half percent loans you can get out there, sure, it's, it's expensive, of course. If you compare, but me that's not a, there is no comparison. <laughs> right. That you're not eligible for that product. Those products are not. Listen, those products are for you to actually live in a home. The homes usually ha it has it's habitable unless you're talking about two other guys. Something mm -hmm. it's habitable. You're living. It's your primary residence for you and your family. Those government loans are not hard money loans. No, no, they're Those not. conventional loans are not hard money loans. You go to a bank and you say, hey, I found a house that has no roof, no siding, no windows, no <laughs> boiler, no plumbing. And there's probably 
illegal activity going on right. in and out of the house every single day. And by the way, it's collapsing. Can you lend me money on it at three and a half percent? What bank is going to say yes? N- n- none that I know of. I tell you, I would love to apply for those loans. Nah. We've nah. been in the industry for some time. We don't know that. It's great that your bars seem to understand the power of leverage. It compounds. Mm-hmm. They have the ability to be into a project. Okay? There is sacrifice. And I know nobody likes to hear that word because it's painful, right? But there is. There's sacrifice in payment every month. There's sacrifice in making the commitment to do it. There's sacrifice in spending the time to do it. Nothing's easy and nothing's free, but it is available. And I think that's where once they have the dream to do this, if they really commit it to the project, they will see this is rinse, wash, and repeat. Yep, that's all it is. And, um, yeah, so that's our, our segment on hard money lending, right? I think we answered a lot of questions. If you guys have more questions, just um, send them through the YouTube channel or you can ask in the DM on the Instagram or on Facebook. But uh, that was our session on our money lending today. Thank I you for Ralph Farido for stopping by. You are Got more anything than you want to add? No, most you are most welcome. First of all, having me here, it's a pleasure, and I'm looking forward to people that if you tell me from the podcast. Mm-hmm. If you call in on that, mm-hmm. make sure I'm aware. I will make yeah, absolutely. I'll make sure that because there's definitely I, I will do something. I will make sure to give them some sort of assistance. That I'll help work with the appraisal. I'll do something for them. Absolutely. To know that they came through this channel. Absolutely. Let's do it. Thank you for listening to the Real Estate Informant Podcast. Tune in for a new episode every Thursday. You can find all of our latest episodes on iTunes, Spotify, and Stitcher. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Real Estate Informant. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, The Real Estate Informant, for visual episodes of all of our podcasts.